uh, I'll just start off with a huge congratulations. I mean, I loved the film when I saw it, but to see how it's been received, 98% on Rotten Tomatoes as of last night. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I usually avoid the critics on my stuff just because, you know, artist. But, you know, it's a, but that's actually nice to hear. That feels good. <laughs> it's funny that that's even a metric that everybody uses nowadays. I feel like when that site started, it was all just like kind of a joke, but now yeah. that's like the key metric. Oh, yeah. Well, what's funny is it's like the key metric is to like, if it's a bad score, go, oh, that's a critic score. Now I want to see, you know, and see right. what the audience score is too. So, yeah, it's, I always aim for the audio audience scores. Like at the film festivals we've been going to, the audience awards, like my favorite one we've been getting. So, yeah. cause you know, that's, that's who you're aiming for, you know? Totally. <laughs> well, um, let's talk about, uh, obviously it's a story that everybody's wanted to see. It's kind of one of the biggest stories in surfing. So I understand why you would want to tell the story, but I'm curious how you were handed the keys to the story. I'm sure there's a lot of people who have been denied maybe access to this story before. How did this end up in your lap? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the book I actually work off of, David Davis that wrote the book on this, he, you know, he, he struggled to get in with Hawaiians too. He was originally an LA Times writer and, and it, was, it, was a, it was a rough one for him because, you know, especially for people that, you know, for an island that's, that's so used to people coming in and just kind of capitalizing on their things, you know, oh. they, they kind of, you know, they think twice about it, which I, I get, I understand, you know, at the same time, it is a culture that loves to share. So they do want to share. It's just, it's a matter of, okay, like, are you going to treat us right? Is usually the question it, that hits them. Um, for me, yeah, it starts, it's, it, <coughs> sorry, it, it does start with my uncle, my uncle, Jan Fisher, who, uh, he made the statue of Duke Kanemoku, um, that's on the beach of Waikiki. So, the reason I'm even Polynesian is because of him. He was there living in Hawaii. My mom went to live with him because he was a professor too of art. And she found a Tongan immigrant that <laughs> just headed in there. And then, uh, you know, she left Hawaii with a little brown baby. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, that's how I happened. And then since I was my uncle's um, Polynesian baby, you know, he would always make sure I knew about this guy. Like, he's like, he's like, you, you're connected to one of these guys. You're, this is what you are and all this. And so, Growing up is what, you know, I just always knew the story. What I wasn't too aware of, though, is that not everybody did know the story. You mm -hmm. know, I figured, you know, statues in three different countries would be a pretty good sign to people that, you know, this guy's a, a big deal. But but it wasn't. So, yeah, right before he died, um, my career had really started to move. If, if most people knew, like people knew what I was doing out of like, like, if you knew Imagine Dragons, if you knew like the Demons music video or the Gold music video, a lot of people didn't know Polynesian was doing their early music videos. And uh, my uncle was just excited that his nephew was doing this stuff, that I jumped into the arts like him, even though I wasn't making statues. I could never do what he did. But uh, <laughs> but he took an interest and just told me, you ought to try telling this story. Um, I was known, too, for the docs I did. You know, I lived with bands. I traveled the world. You know, I, I if you've seen uh, oh, the Cameron Crowe movie, uh, Almost Famous, you know, I'd pretty mm -hmm. much lived that as from a documentary standpoint. And... And so he just, you know, why don't you give it a shot? And then he died shortly after that. And so it was one of those things where, you know, with Polynesian boys, you want us to do something, get to our uncles. And uh, and especially, you know, if it's one of the last things they ask you to try to do. So so at his funeral, I just couldn't get it out of my head. I gotta do this. I gotta I gotta chase this down. And so I found the book. I met up with David Davis, and then I took the took the book that I found to a friend in LA and he connected me to Sidewinder Films out in LA and these guys what I really liked about these guys too is one I wanted to do a movie um but they they wanted a documentary and and I was like well then I'll do a documentary you know if, if you're willing to put the story I'm just I, I want to tell the story so yeah. I'll do that and but the treatment I'd written out for a movie I just kind of adjusted to to be for a documentary in this one and so that's kind of what ended up shaping this and then and then, you know, what I liked about the Sidewinder guys, like I was going to say, is, is that they're a nonprofit organization. And it's, it's a pretty big deal to be able to tell the Hawaiians, I am here to tell Duke's story. This guy isn't just your guy. I'm a Polynesian. This is my guy, too. This is our culture. He represents who we are as a whole. You know, Hawaii especially. I'm glad it was a Hawaiian because the Hawaiians are such a special people. But then as a whole for the entire Pacific, you know, the island Pacific people, Duke means so much. And so I was just, I was telling him, you know, I'm here for this. And then the guys 
you know, that are funding this and helping me do this are not here for money. They're a nonprofit. They're here to tell the story with me. And that's what just helped just swing the door open from there for us. Amazing. Yeah, yeah I think David Davis uh, probably earned a lot of credibility with that yeah. book as well, because it's so well researched. It's so academic. It's not sensationalized in any way. Yeah. Even know, the I, stuff, I, even I like the personal, say, yeah. the personal stuff about his dating when remote romantic yeah. life and all that is just told matter of factly, you know? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, one of the things about it that earned him a lot of respect is, is since he wasn't all the way in, he did have to live off of articles, like what he could research. And he is a very good researcher. When yeah. you see newspaper articles, that's David Davis helping to get those. And there's a lot in the documentary. So yeah. it's, uh, no, he, he knew his stuff. And so when people saw this book and when people do see it, what's nice is to see something that isn't just, Duke is covered in legend, you know? And that's a good yeah. thing. You know, that's what makes heroes is, is a little bit of that legend. You know, we all put a little spice on the stories. That's what's fun. But to get something that's just so comprehensive that, I mean, there's even newspaper articles where you're like, come on, but, but mm -hmm. hey, it's in the newspaper. Let's put it in there. You know, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, that's, he earned a lot of respect in that sense in that, that he was still able to tell a story that people could, could really appreciate and the Hawaiian people too, because, you know, it, it was written. He wasn't making things yeah. up and he wasn't trying to make money off this. He, he fell into this story while he was writing about Jim Thorpe, you know, and, right. and he was like, wait a minute, who's this guy? How come no one talks about this guy? And so it's funny when he and I met, it was, it was, it was kind of a funny, we met at this little diner in LA, you know, and, and we were both just blowing up at each other. Yeah. Why don't they talk about this? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It was like, it was like so fun to meet someone just as excited as I was about Duke. Right. So, so yeah, he and I hit it off really well. <laughs> Good. Um, so I'm curious who, who were the gatekeepers maybe of this story? Was it surviving family members? And then also, what do they think of the project now that they've seen the final version? Um, I, I'd say, you know, gatekeepers is kind of a, since Duke didn't have any children, there, there really isn't a, a necessary gatekeeper on the story. You know, what it was, what it is, is just who wants to tackle it and, and, and just really it's, it's, it's like surfing, you know, who's going to jump on this wave and make something out of it. You know, you look at the, the waves during the Olympics and it, it they were not good waves right. out there in Japan. And that's kind of what it felt like, you know, it's like, can I ride this, turn it into something and end up like Carissa Moore, you know, that's, that's <laughs> kind of what it was. And, and, and the irony too, is they wanted a doc was so we could release it in time for the Olympics, you know, so it's, it kind okay. of ties in with that, but, but yeah, there, I'd say really the gatekeepers are, are the people that just represent Hawaiian culture. There was a lot of people in there that when I felt like, Ooh, okay, they, they want me to do this, or they're on our backs, you know, to, to help us get this done. Um, there was, you know, Billy Pratt, he's in the doc a little bit. I mean, he's, he's, he's so small in it. He's at the very end of the documentary talking about the Duke foundation and the, the Waterman foundation and things like that. But he, when he got on board with it, you know, he, he was one of them that he just knew everybody for us to help us out. And then he would point us to the people we could talk to. And then it was up to me and my producers to sit down and go, okay, this is why we're here. And it, and it was fun. You know, it's, I've never cared about race and you know, what someone is or what anything like that. I just want to work with the best. And, and, but it, you could see it, you know, this was one of those times where I was like, I could see why this matters. But yeah. that I, I'd sit down at an interview with someone like a Buffalo Keolana, who's, you know, he's the Kaha, you know, he's, he's the West side, you know, he's, He's one of the most respected and you could tell it meant something to him to see a Polynesian sitting across from him. And, and, you know, a poly that wasn't just handed what I had, I, I killed myself to get, I'm not anywhere really, but to get where I was right there, you know, and then, and they, and they got, and they wanted to help me too. From that point yeah. on, they're like, Hey, he's one of us. And then they, yeah. man, Namakaha came out They They were awesome, you know, and amazing and all over. I mean, I've been doing this since I was 13 and during one of the recreations, you know, we were out there shooting and it was during the the rescue scene, all the crazy stuff we do in that one. And I looked around and for the first time in my life, and I'd never asked for it, but for the first time in my life, my entire crew that was shooting with me was Polynesians. I was like, holy cow, Maori, Hawaiian, Samoan. I'm like, I'm Tongan. It's like, what the heck? Like, look at this. I was like, and they're all like looking around like, oh yeah. And it was just fun to have it as an, oh yeah, not something we forced. It was just right. like a, 
And it was like one of those, hey, we want to work with the best. And right now, this is the best. And so we, and, and in those kind of moments, I don't know, it's maybe, you know, maybe Duke set it up, but it's like, yeah. uh, all of us just had so much pride in the moment. And, and we were working on Duke and we were doing these things. So it's, you know, it's, yeah, I think, I think just being one of us and then, and then just the right people just getting excited with us helped open a lot of doors. Do you know if Buffalo has seen the final cut? Yeah, yeah, he has. He saw, he, well, he, I don't know about the final final yet. I imagine he has, but he saw one of my very first under a hundred minute cuts, you know? And so, so he, and he, you know, Brian, his son sent back all of his feedback on it. It was just like, oh, we're all crying. And I was like, oh, I'm crying now too. So it was like, uh, you know, it's like one of those things where it's, because it, it wasn't just like making sure you tell this story and don't exploit us, but it's like, tell it in a way that, that we see Duke, you know, see it like, like, cause to me, you know, and I, I say it a million times, you know, Duke to me was Superman and I wanted him to look like Superman and, and man of steel by Zack Snyder, you know, I love his stylizing. And so if you look at the way I color the scenes and the way I make sure we shot it, it's very similar to that. Cause I'm just like, I want it to feel like Superman. And, and so I think for those that feel that way about Duke, they kind of sense that. Yeah, it's a Superman uh, humble or grounded in humility. Yeah, and it's one of his superpowers. Grace. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It really is. Yeah, it's in stark contrast to the way that you know the idols that we were raised with. Um, I'm gonna read a quote that the film opens on, and then mm-hmm. ask you a question about that quote. Um, the film opens on a quote from King Kamehameha in an article for the New York Herald Tribune in 1929. Mm-hmm. And it says that on King Kamehameha's deathbed, he predicted that, quote, someday my people will lose their freedom and their nationality. But before they are entirely gone, there will come one in my image who shall have within him all the glorious strength of a dying race. And he shall be honored throughout the world and shall bring fame to my people. I would like, if you could, to set the stage politically and historically um, in the way that the opening credits did for the film, yeah, yeah. for listeners to kind of understand uh, the climate that Duke was born into. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and that, honestly, that was probably the hardest part of this doc was how to figure out how to do that. Because- You uh, did it great. It, it's <laughs> really well done and concise. Yeah, it, it was, uh, I'd say, let's see, when did I start? I changed it up. Like I had my first cut of this thing. The first, well, it was over a hundred minutes. So I knew it was going to get chopped down, but it was uh, where the act one was trying to tell history as I told Duke. And it was like, it was so boring. And, and it was like, and it was so hard to go back and forth because you felt, I felt you're losing focus on Duke through right. this whole thing. So yeah, we, we switched up to, this thing uh one of my favorite movies was by peter berg it's called the kingdom oh, and yeah. uh and it's it's one that's kind of slipped under the radar on a lot of people so people that don't know it they really should watch it it's it's excellent an excellent movie you know but it, it gives you the entire history of terrorism in saudi arabia and how the connection works there in the opening credits and i was like you know what how did they do that you know and how could i do that and so yeah i stuffed 29 documentaries into that first three minute segment is my kind of way also to tell the audience like this is not a movie about the history of hawaii this is a movie about duke but we can't tell it without the history of hawaii but this is also another way of saying like this has been done a thousand times here's a ton of docs that talk about the history of hawaii let's give you what you need to know to know about duke and so yeah it along with that quote it lays it out pretty much in the sense that this entire kingdom had come up, had risen to the point where a king had united them. They were fruitful. They, they'd done, you know, they were the meeting point between, between the, you know, an entire continent to, till it gets to the U S you know, and, and, and they, they gained a lot of power and then fallen, completely fallen. You know, by the time Duke was born in 1890, there was, God, I want to say like 90% of the population had died. The queen had lost her power, you know, well, was losing her power. He was alive, but it was still a kingdom. And, and it was just, it was in a, in a total fall, to, you know, to the, to the really the sad events that set up what, what happened to Hawaii, eventually falling into a, the U.S. As a, as a territory, you know, and even the U.S. And I wanted to make sure that was pointed out that even Grover Cleveland was like, yo, we shouldn't, 
we shouldn't do this, you know? And so of course the Senate and everyone that really wanted Hawaii, you know, just waited until he was out of office and then took it as a territory, you know? So it's like, uh, it's even, we even knew like, you know, something's weird right now. It doesn't feel right. You know, so that that's the situation Duke was born into. By the time he was, he was born and he was going to school, like the school systems had decided that westernizing and, and something that would meet better with the United States and England and, and as a trading partner to all these countries was better than Hawaiian tradition. And so he's going to school, not allowed to speak Hawaiian. He's not allowed to practice his traditions. He's not allowed to do a lot of things when he's born. And I think that's where a quote like that hits pretty hard because it had happened. Like they were, the Hawaiians were on their way to being just eviscerated. They were, they were, they're on their way out. And yeah. And then he comes Duke, you know, the guy that a lot of people don't know. He was a soccer star actually in high school and, you know, when he's 14 and deciding, you know what, I want to go with the tradition. I want to focus on the things that are almost gone that no one's doing, you know, surfing was being pushed out, you know, things that, meant so much to the Hawaiian people. Duke was like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on that. I'm going to be a waterman. One of the most honored positions that isn't a real position. It's honorific is the best way to describe it. But it's a, you know, a title that when you receive it as a Hawaiian, it means you have, you've accomplished what Hawaiians found the most pride in becoming. And so, yeah, that's, that's where that quote hits. What I also like about that quote too, is it's controversial. You know, that is one of Hmm. those things that, yeah, I wanted legend to live in this a little too, because I, you know, talking to, there's, you know, you get all types of political sides and people to believe whatever and whatnot in Hawaii. It was just kind of, I mean, I shouldn't say fun, but it is kind of, kind of fun to see them go, well, I mean, where does it start? Can you prove it? And I'd be like, well, can you prove it didn't happen? And they're like, well, <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, it's in the paper. I'm like, so I'm going to go with what's in the paper and just yeah. go with that, you know? And so it's, yeah. That's why it is it is laid out before that it's like this came from a, a newspaper article and we're not totally sure where it came from but it came from a newspaper article there are hawaiians that stand by it and there's other hawaiians that no i was like cool well then it's going in because i'd love to not create controversy but throw in legend because yeah legend i mean it's that liberty vance story it's the it's the how did that line go when truth so it's pretty much when truth overrides the legend print the legend is what that what that movie points out and it's it's like one of my favorite things from an old old western movie you know that really just hits hard still today and it was one of those things where well let's let's just start with the legend and then go into the story that could make people go wow that could be this guy and then yeah. end it with that too and so it's kind of bookended so yeah, yeah. it's uh, so the situation duke was in set up a perfect way for him to really maybe be the guy yeah so uh, you told it beautifully, but to reset, Duke comes about where his culture is being stripped away from him, even in his homeland. And so this is an opportunity to kind of reintroduce, not only establish the culture back in Hawaii, but then reintroduce the culture or introduce for the first time the culture uh, to the rest of the world. Yeah. And so swimming is the vehicle that this happens through. Yeah, I think yeah. a lot of people know that kind of overall story. But can you tell me the story about um, the first official swim meet that Duke competed in? Oh, yeah. You know, when I, when I was pitching this to people, that was one of the first things I'd bring up. You know, I'd, I'd start off with how many American athletes do you know have, at, have statues and monuments dedicated to them in three different countries, four statues total, you know, counting the one in California, you know, and, and then I would go. And if you want to know how crazy it is, this guy beat a world record by four seconds the first time he tried swimming. You know, it's like, and it's just, it's so shocking that it just gets, it's the best hook ever. Hook, hook. I mean, he provided the best hook on my pitch every time, you know? Yeah. And it's, uh, and it is, yeah. And the AAU came in and for the Hawaiians, they were excited. You know, the Hawaiian power brokers, the people that were the landowners and the money makers, because, you know, they're still Americans, but they're off in this distant island and they just want to be recognized. Hey, we are Americans. We are one of you. Mm-hmm. And so the AAU showing up and saying, okay. Let's see what you got out there. You know, they it's it's exciting for them. And and there's this guy that the Outrigger Club, which was an all white club at the time, you know, built to built to attract the European model and the European tourists and the American tourists. And so because the people that weren't necessarily all racist in that place, it was just this is what will attract people. 
I just I do that because I really the outrigger becomes such a big part of Duke's life later on. But they they have this great athletic club and this guy Duke beating them in everything they did. And and Duke was also their teacher and trainer. And so But he yeah, wasn't allowed like, to be a member. Yeah, but he was not allowed to be a member, but he's on every boat ride. He's on everything with them, helping them, teaching them. The, the and he was on the advertising world. too, wasn't he? Oh, he's on the very first magazine the club puts out and sends right. to the world to attract people right. to Hawaii. It's Duke on a surfboard, you know, and it's and it's it's funny. But of course, the first race happens and they're like, hey, you know, one of the guys is like, why don't you uh, why don't you give this a shot? Why don't you go race these guys for the heck of it? You know, I think some of the locals honestly wanted him to see to get beat by trained swimmers. They just wanted to see it happen finally. And and so Duke's standing there like, all right, I'll go race these guys <laughs> and jumps in the water. And, you know, 55 seconds later, he's he's completely changed his life. And it's it's funny to me because, you know, I, the moment's big enough for me that I wanted people to feel that in the documentary. And so there's something I hid actually in that section. It's uh, when he, yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's an artist thing. You know, my mom used to tell me, you know, she'd take me to art galleries and then have me look at the paintings and look at the brush strokes and say, look at the intention, look at where it, look where it gets detailed. And so I'm like, all right, well, I want this to have intention. So let's put some detail in it. So yeah, when he jumps in and hits the water, there's a little red flash frame underwater that hits. If you're able to pause at home, which no one can yet, but if you're able to pause, it's it's used to say start. It's kind of, I've really smashed it down, but it's there, that red flash frame from there to the photo finish of the of the scene is the exact time that Duke swam. So okay. that I could give the audience the feel of how fast he really was that he swam that race. And and it's just fun to, to see if I could stuff the story inside yeah. the time he swam it. But yeah, he came out of that water a chain like no one believed it you know the aau came in here like all right see what you got and suddenly they find out i mean we're talking four seconds in a race that is usually point something when you right. win and so they're like right that really happened they don't believe anything in hawaii if anything it made them believe less in hawaii because there's like okay they don't know how to wear clocks so <laughs> they don't know what's going on out there obviously there's there's still natives running around out there you know yeah yeah and that's what brings him to america and eventually puts him on the u.s team right um there's so many little side tangents that we could take to tell oh, yeah. to unpack the story but i'm going to kind of limit it because yeah, yeah. ultimately l listeners can just go watch the film and see all the stuff yeah. um there is a bit of adversity there's controversy related to that win and he has to go and defend it he runs into some hurdles but ultimately oh, yeah. He validates, you know, well, himself Pitt, as the, scene, one of the actually, greatest. You know, the Pittsburgh part where he fails is something that a lot of the Hawaiians that I talked to didn't even know about. Really? Because yeah, it's it's one of those things where a lot of them, a lot of people have just been taught, oh, he was the best at all times at all things, right. and the thought of him failing, you know, was just no, no, Duke didn't just lose, especially then when he was young and. And all those things but yeah i like that story because it, it it actually ends up showing and i won't yeah go too crazy so people can watch it too but it's it's one of those things where you realize how humble this guy was someone Agreed. that he never ever lost anything goes to pittsburgh and is completely set up to fail no one can ride on trains and boats for two straight weeks go straight out into the cold for the first time of their life and then swim without rest you know and then expect to be good and yet He's like, all right, well, I'm here. Let me get better. And it, it's it's just one of those things. And, and it shows how coachable he was and how just how good he was. I know. And he wins. I mean, we're talking when he swam in that pool in Pittsburgh, he was destroying a racial segregated, racially segregated thing in the country. And it's it's that's even brushed over in the dock. Like no one of any other color was allowed to swim in pools at that time. Wow. And here's Duke straight into a pool right, right when he gets off yeah. a train you know well and, un unpack yeah. that a little bit um where does duke fit into the lineage of kind of non-white athletes to break through into mainstream success oh man he's he is one of the most revolutionary to to hit i mean he's you look at the way even jim thorpe was treated after the olympics in 1912 <clears throat> the guy that i mean he won on shoes he found in a trash can and won wow. everything, you know, and, you know, Jim Thorpe was incredible, yet he was still that Native American. He was treated like it. And he was just 
he was always kind of pushed to the side. His story is so sad, you know, how it goes. But then you get Duke in the exact same era, the exact same Olympics. He comes home a, su a superstar and he, he's able to travel the whole country. He's able to break racial lines everywhere he goes. So he goes to Australia where they don't, they don't let people of his color on the beaches where he goes. And yet there he is. Oh, and then he takes a girl in with him in the same beaches. They don't allow girls, you know, and it's just mm -hmm. like he is he's he found a way to break through lines so well that it, in a way it goes unnoticed. And that's that's kind of the weird things about it. And I like Isaiah Walker is one of the really well spoken ones in the documentary, Agreed. you know, and his his book is awesome. If anyone gets to look at it about surfing, yeah, I mean, if there's if there's a better guy to talk about surfing, I haven't met him. <laughs> He's, that guy, when it comes to surf history, talk to Isaiah. But uh, but he he says that what Duke was able to do was to identify himself as a Hawaiian rather than a person of color. And, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that for the first time the world was seeing Polynesians, you know, we is, you know, Americans had seen, you know, if there's from Asian to black to native American to anything to even the Irish at the time, it was like a, like racism was kind of easy because they could say, Oh, that's what we don't like. That's what they grew up around, but they were seeing this guy of a different culture from a different world to them for the first time ever. And he just happened to be, an incredible athlete that was the kindest human being you could ever imagine. It was just impossible to hate him. And so mm. he, you know, 26 some odd movies in Hollywood and the time they would rather color someone a different color than put them in a movie. You know, he was doing this effortlessly. And, and what it does for Polynesians in general is if, if you go around people that know Polynesians, there's a stereotype that usually comes with us, which is usually really athletic, nice people. You know, you look at football players like the Troy Palomalus and all those, like like we're junior sales, where those happy go lucky great athletes is what Polynesians are. And the stereotype is easy to tie straight back to Duke because he was the first. He was the first to be seen. He's the first in Hollywood, first on the world stage. And it's stuck. You look at The Rock, you look at yeah. you know, you look at Jason Momoa, you look at all our guys, and it's like we're just known as Taika Waititi. Happy go lucky yeah. guys that are athletic, you know, it's just kind of a it's it's really amazing what he pulls off and it really does deserve more credit than it gets. Yeah, that's fascinating. I never thought about that um, commonality being tied directly back to Duke, but you're right. Yeah, it's 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 there. Well, it's funny, too. You, you look at I mean, think of the era like back then, <laughs> you know, you, you know, anything of any other color was just ah, we can't do it. even Hollywood. They loved yeah. Duke, but they knew they could never give him a leading lady. And so yeah. it was like, we can't make you a star because we can't give you a leading lady that anyone in America would be able to live with right now or we'd yeah. be able to sell. Yet anybody from anywhere in the country would love to put on a Hawaiian shirt and act like a Hawaiian. Yeah, and it, yeah, it was yeah. like he had just pulled off this miracle in America that I would like to think helped set the stage for people to be in a little more open minded. Yeah, you know, I think so. Well, the other detail too that was in the film is um, the perception that Americans had of Hawaii and maybe Polynesia at large was really just through marketing made by white people about that area, you know? So <laughs> it's sexualizing the women hula dancers and things like that. So Duke being able to give them a more authentic and realistic perception of it or perspective is yeah. also important. Yeah, the, the way he beats what they wanted to manufacture to sell exactly. the people, yeah. you know, and it, you know, the, it, it, history helped him a little there too when you think about it, because I there was a whole section in the doc that I loved. It was really hard for me to cut actually, where I had put, I, I I'd followed kind of what Hollywood and what all these places had had created with the, the Polynesian people because they were they were just in stories. It was like the the ship captains that would get lost at sea and then find these incredibly beautiful people and kind people and live with them and travel and then captain cook who loved them all and then accidentally went to hawaii twice and the second time didn't go well for him but mm -hmm. you know it's like uh like they were just mythical and so it was like it, that helped set up duke i think too but yeah but yeah it's 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 fun I, and i love that when i think of the stereotype it's like it, it it's obvious that it connects to duke yeah. You know, most of us, like when I say I'm Tongan, I, cause I lived in Illinois for a while and I remember people would be like, so what are you? You know, finally they just get, they try to be kind. Yeah. Like, so, you know, and I'm just like, just ask, it's okay. I'm Brown. I get it. You know, 
yeah. I got like seven vowels in my name. I get it. You know, it's like, oh yeah, well, so what? I'm like, I'm Tongan. Like, what is that? I was like, well, you know, Hawaii. They're like, yeah, it's like that. You know, all around the world, that's how I explain what I am as a Tongan. Yep. You know, and yeah. I mean, that's thanks to Duke. Well, that's like me. I'm from Southern California, a little suburb that people around the world have never heard of. So whenever I'm around the world and they ask, I just yeah. say I live near Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the yeah. indicator. They're like, I know where Disneyland is. Yeah, yeah. It, it's both, yeah. Even more than Orange uh, County, they would know that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I want to come back real quick uh, to the Philadelphia pool story. Mm. You talked about Duke uh, having traveled all that time and then being thrown into the pool. What you didn't say is he'd also never swimmed in a pool before. Yeah. And also the rules of swimming in a pool are specific to a pool, like the kick or in technique as well. So the yeah. kick turn that people have learned how to do propels them into the second direction. What that reminded me of was wave pools nowadays. Yeah. Like because the WSL is running a surf comp on the world tour in yeah. a wave pool. And it's so, I've surfed that wave pool. It's so wildly different than the you surfing Kelly's experience. Wave pool? Yeah. Dude, yeah. nice, nice. And it's so wildly different than the surfing experience in the ocean. Yeah. It takes forever to wrap your brain around it. And certainly yeah. coaching will help you. So um, Duke kind of transitioning from one to the other, there's no way that he would be able to do it on his first try. But like you said, the humility of, somebody who's a fish out of water saying, I'm going to stay out of water essentially and stay yeah. in cold Philadelphia to get the training, to learn how to do it on these terms. I'm going to yeah. learn how to compete in a pool because there are going to be other races in the pool and learn to master that thing um, is a fascinating subplot. Oh know? yeah, man. I mean, if you think about it, like salt water is buoyant. And, and, and so he's, he's not used to something attacking him either. Cause I mean, anyone that's surfed in Hawaii, it's like, it's like jumping into a bathtub out there. It's, it is not like, I can't get in the water in California. That's for sure. I, I, I just touch off my toe and I'm like, how do you guys do this? I'm like, right. I'm going to go back to the islands. I'll get in that stuff, you know? Right. So yeah, all the things that, that he felt there and you're right. The technique is what in pools is where it really hits hard. The, the yeah. irony is that he spent all that time learning the technique. And then when he went to Sweden for the Olympics, it was an open pool to the ocean. So he swam in exactly what he was used to swimming in, in Hawaii. Right. But, but um, you know, it, it's what made him un unbeatable at the same time. Another story that's touched or that's uh, unpacked in the film, you touched on it in our conversation here was um, Duke's role in normalizing female board riding in Australia. Yeah. Can you tell that story? Yeah, but it's one of those stories. And, and this is another one where in Australia, the, the time you kind of, I don't want to, how do I want to put it? it <laughs> everyone has their own little twist on the story, I guess they should okay. say. And so it's really fun because, you know, first you get there and, and no one corrected anyone on errors at the time. So okay. it's kind of like if you read the Bible, you, you do get differences in the, in the, four, the four gospels, you know, so it's kind of that kind of thing going on there. But yeah, it's it's at Manly Beach when when he he's pulled up and they want to see can you can you uh call oh, what is it called tandem can you serve tandem you know and Duke's like oh yeah and he picks out Isabel Latham you know how she was lined up exactly we're not sure because she was a rebel her daddy didn't like her on the beach but she was doing whatever she wants I got a daughter like that so I get it <laughs> you know it's like what I say no to is what she's gonna do so it's uh you have to get creative in how you get her to be totally. a little obedient to the world but uh it's um it's a different podcast yeah it's a totally different podcast you know i'm still figuring that one out and you know a latina polynesian tell you what that's a that's a fireball that likes to fight but uh <laughs> but um yeah he finds this this girl who just happened to be not just a girl on the beach but the right kind of girl for what was going on and in tandem serves with her takes her out into the water where women were not allowed on that beach especially at the time and starts surfing, you know, put, pulls her onto his shoulders. And then she surfs for the rest of her life. She becomes an icon in, in Australia. She's, she, you know, the, the guy that says the myth is, is the one that's like, we're not sure. He's like one of those that doesn't like saying because he doesn't have it written if she's the first, but you talk to anybody else, they're like, ah, she's the first. Yeah, yeah, why not? You know, why not? Why right. might take that away from her? Cause she, she lived it. She loved it. And she used that 
throughout the rest of her life to help fight for women's rights in Australia. And, and it really did change a lot of things like her specifically changed. She changed a lot. And she, she was, you, you look at a lot of the, the top surfers today from Australia. They know who she is. Oh yeah. You know, she's, she's an icon and it's, totally. it starts with her just being the girl that served at Duke and it's, yeah. and it's really cool. Like the guy, I think it's Tim in this story that tell in Australia, the Australia section, he just tells the story with such like a, a smile on his face. Cause he got to talk to her about it before she died. Okay. And, and just the way she says that he, he grabbed her by the scruff of her neck and picked her yeah. up and held her on the board. And she felt like she was falling off a cliff. I mean, anyone that's ever caught a wave knows that feeling, you know, it's like, it's like, what is this? You know, and it's, and we usually, you spend the rest of your life looking for that feeling again, but you know, it's just, it's, it's such a huge moment in history in Australia. And yet for Duke, he's just, oh, let's just have some fun. You know, Duke is the guy that when the outrigger was an all white, all male club was like, okay, cool. You guys do that and starts his own club with his brothers, which is all races and all genders. And so Duke was like, and he wasn't like saying, no, 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 you guys, yeah, if that's what you want, that's what you want. We're going to do it this way. Cause the, to him, the ocean was for everybody to play in. Right. And so he just didn't never thought twice about something like that. Yeah. The rec uh, recreation or reenactment sequence in the Isabel Latham portion was yeah. really beautifully shot and the waves that they, they catch and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. You guys completely scored on that day. <laughs> Thanks, man. What's funny is like when we started shooting that scene, there were no waves. I was like, oh, oh really? Crap, we're screwed. Yeah, like, yeah, because you can't. I mean, you know, surf competitions. They're like, it might be these days, you know, right. <laughs> and we're sitting there going, we only have two days to shoot. So it has to be this day. And yeah, I, there's, there's, a, if you look at the first time, actually, he rides in the beach, he rides the board all the way in and steps Dwayne DeSoto, just a gift of a human being, you know, rides in and it just steps off the board on the beach, rides it all yes. the way out of the sand. That was from like a drone wave. shot, right? Yeah. yeah that yeah, was the yeah. first wave that hit. And, and that's, he'll talk about that scene. If you ever hear him where people say, was there ever a moment? And it was that one for him and for all of us really on that beach that day in Mikaha, because we weren't getting anything. I was like, I don't know what we got to do. We got to shift it where he's out there in the water and he finally sees a wave, gets on it and starts riding. And he just keeps riding. And all of us, like just, we watched him go from, and that drone was the only thing running at the time. Cause we were still just trying to figure out what's going on. And he was just practicing and, and Dwayne just wrote it. God, it was such a long ride. <laughs> I actually can't, I have I've shown the clip a couple of times. I go speak at schools and I'll show them this clip because it's such a big moment. But yeah, he rode that wave all the way down from one corner of Makaha all the way across in front of us. It's it, it's just an amazing ride. And when he rode into the beach, he said, OK, Duke's with us now. And then we had great waves from that point on to get all those shots that you see in that sequence and then to take our actress out as Isabel and to ride with him you know, and all that stuff. So yeah, it was a real special moment because it just felt almost spiritual on the beach. Amazing. You know, really like I'm glad there. to hear that. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to hear that because l my thought was um, more of a, like a tech uh, production concern. Like I know you only have a couple of days to film. How right. are you going to get good waves? But the waves that you got were fit the story so perfectly because yeah. when you're talking about him surfing tandem you obviously don't want big pumping surf yeah. and it was just these perfect peeling little crystal blue waist yeah. high like the most ideal setup that you could possibly imagine so then I was thinking well geez maybe they just waited for the exact right conditions to schedule <laughs> the day of shooting but there's too much to schedule there's too many people like oh yeah put it came well, together. like the rescue scene we shot in six hours you know and then the no you know, way yeah the, all the all the australia stuff we shot you know from about oh, sun was up for about two hours all the way until just before sunset on one day it was all of australia and it was it was just one of those things but you know honestly you felt like it was gonna work and and that's another one of those things where wow hawaii something special is going on because because when we took that board out the board that's being shaped throughout the whole documentary to start shooting on it, Dwayne was insistent. He's like, I'm gonna ride Duke's board like Duke. So he's riding this thing without a fin on the bottom, you know, and, and it's a 110 pound board, but but we take that board to the beach and and there was all the Hawaiians there helping us. They were on my crew and, and working with us. It, it was like silence. And it was like, it was a weird feeling looking at the, looking around at everybody and then realizing 
we, we set up the board for that for that closing shot. That's the first thing we shot on the beach that morning, but <laughs> that everyone was looking at a wooden board shaped the way Duke would shape it with Duke's name on it. And the last time that board, a board like that was probably on that beach was, was when Duke was holding it. So it was like one of those moments where you could tell, wow, this, this is heavy. Like this, it wasn't just like, oh, cool. Like for me, you know, I was like, oh man, we can't mess this up. We got to do really good with this. But it felt like, man, everything I think is going to work. It feels like Hawaii's here. It feels like Duke's here. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's moments like that with Dwayne where he caught that wave and he got off and he was like, okay, that was special. Something's up. Yeah. You know, and, wow. and, and then Dwayne, my gosh, going tandem, surfing without a fin on it. it when you watch that footage in slow-mo, it's going sideways as much as it's going forward. And he's steering with one foot while he's holding her on his shoulders. And it's yeah. just, it's just an amazing accomplishment. There's a moment you can um, correct me if I'm wrong yeah. or set the record straight, but there's a cut. There's a moment where it looks like he's purling where the nose is, the nose of the board is going under and it yeah. cuts away. And I'm like, Oh, he clearly purled on that take. Yeah. But then later, I feel like you let that take play out and he actually recovers out of that. Oh yeah. Well, there's, there's a couple of those. There's the, the handstand or the headstand. For instance. That that's what it was. That's he, the one that I'm he dips of. that thing entirely underwater during his headstand. But then when he comes down, lifts it back out of the water yeah he, it, it's it, unbelievable like yeah. i would have bet money that he fully pearled on that oh yeah well it's funny too because like it looks so cool because because he was a little underwater with his head when he flips his head up water is just like like that i was mm -hmm. like i'm like oh like i'm on the beach jumping around and I, i'm kind of He's a, insane well yeah and I, I was raised as a you know a rugby player so for me when i get hyped i go rugby mode and i'm like jumping on people's <laughs> backs like freaking out and right i'm just like oh we got this shot and he comes to the beach and i like tackle i'm just like oh my god like that's funny. you know but but yeah he man that what i like about what he said about that board is he called it a cadillac he's like that thing is a cadillac he says it goes where it wants to go i'm just there yeah, yeah, and it's it's an funny. old Cadillac without yeah. power steering. Yeah, where and it's funny, you know, because there was a time like he fell off the board once, and the board was like, "Well, I'm going." It just kept going, <laughs> and it was like, "I was like, oh my gosh, it's gonna ride into That's the beach." Funny. Yeah. Well, this is a perfect segue to for you to tell me um, or tell listeners how Duke influenced lifeguards to use surfboards as life saving <laughs> implements. Yeah, that's one of the fun ones uh, to see the Californians watch when they when it transitions from him saving the guys in california to a board sitting on the top of a jeep and going and that's when this started yeah which you don't even think about that they had to learn that you know yeah. you just think oh sir it makes perfect sense that surfboards would be used but obviously for a long time they were so large that it would be problematic to try to well, rescue and, and there were no lifeguards at the time you know okay. that's that's another thing other people's don't people don't realize it was only the coast guard they, they handled all the lifeguard duties back then and so they had these boats so they were just kind of like, you know, it's, it's, yeah, the, the scene that changes the world really for, for America, especially is, is that scene in uh, Corona del Mar, I think is what it's called. I forget it out is. in California where, where it's the wedge nowadays usually hits about the same time. And it's just these 25 foot waves flipping a boat and sending 15 sailors and fishermen out into the sea in fully clothed, fully clothed out there. And it's like back then the Coast Guard would watch and go, Ah, well, they're dead. Shoot. You know, <laughs> oh, well, you know, and, and the thing is, watermen, one of the things about watermen is it's not only, you know, fishing and surfing and the things that they needed to, to really to survive in Hawaii, but it's also help people enjoy the ocean, help people live in the ocean and, and understand the danger of it, but also help them survive it. And so for Duke, waterman kicks in, he sees guys suffering out there, far off the line. And, and to him, he's like, well, I got to go do something. And he's going to go through these waves. He, he's got to, he takes that surfboard and just chops through these 25 footers all the way to the boat and just starts grabbing bodies and then flips his board around, throws, throws one at a time. Sometimes it was two. They say the one, one of the trips was three guys on his board and then flips around, rides the surf in, dumps them, flips around and keeps going back and forth. You know, and it's, it's, yeah, it's one of those things where you're watching and when you realize how big the waves were oh, and yeah. anyone that has ever seen the wedge, when it hits, you know, when it, when it's like at its worst, you know, to, to, see, to think of someone doing that, what yeah. he did 
and, and in a time when no one even really knew how to surf is absolutely incredible, you know? And yeah, that moment, cause I know the coast guard tried getting like their little boats through it, but they're not going to ride that. They're not going to get through that. That was literally the only way those guys could be saved. And since Duke knew he was the only one that could really do it, his buddies ended up getting out there with them on one of them. They don't talk about it, but they, they find the waves died down enough that they could help a little bit. But the fact that he pulled that off is when all of like, cause it made newspapers all over California and it just changed the thinking of the coastline. You know, it's like, now we don't have to look at these people and go, crap, they're all dead. Now we can actually give it a shot. Now we can yeah. actually go save them. And yeah, that's when lifeguarding changed in all of California. And, and to this day, you will always see those surfboards either next to the lifeguard stand or on the, on the lifeguard truck. Yeah, because that's still <clears throat> the easiest way to save a lot of times. So it's so it's wild. Was it eight people that he saved? Yeah, eight out of fifteen. Mission? So eight, and then after he saved those people, he continued going back and pulling yeah. deceased people. Ones. Yeah, and that's out of uh, the box, which is incredible. It, it really is, you know. And it's, I mean, all the heartbreak, and that, and that's why I love. I remember the first time I watched This Is Your Life. You know, I watched This Is Your Life before I found the book. And I remember that I'll always remember the first time I watched it because that face he makes when he sits down and he's just thinking still, you could see that it was, it was killing him. And, and it's one of those things that it got cut out of one of the interviews and I wish there was a way I could have stuffed it in, but he was out there telling people I'll be back for you. And when he comes back, they're wow. not, they're not alive anymore. Oh. And so he's like, he's feeling like a failure. Cause you know, the guy, he just said, don't worry, just hold on is no longer alive. And yeah. he just, he wouldn't give up. He was going back and forth until at least all the bodies were back, you know, and it's, it's like, it affected him for the rest of his life. And that's something that you referenced too in the movie is um, all the news outlets wanted to interview him after this heroic feat. Yeah. And he didn't want to be interviewed because he viewed it as a partial failure, you know? Yeah, he couldn't, he couldn't save him. And, and he was just hurt, you know? He, he, it's insane. It's in. You talk to any of those watermen, you you know, everybody should meet the Kailanas out of Makaha because they are they are easily the the watermen today. There's the Kailenis that are definitely like the great watermen today too, but you get to those traditional ones too, like that are like, lifeguarding. Yeah, dead yeah. on and, and you know, Brian Kailana is, you know, the kid they're still changing lifeguarding today, you yeah. know, and all the way they do everything, but they'll talk about that all the time. It's it's like there's just this it's it's called a kuleana it's it's a promise it's a responsibility you feel but it's a resp it's a responsibility you accept and you take willingly like you want it you want that kuleana and and it's and it's all for different things but for the waterman it's the ocean and so for duke his kuleana is i need everyone to love the ocean i need people to live and enjoy it and so when he didn't pull it off it's like he's hurt that thing that that responsibility he's, he's accepted so you can understand yeah. the hurt and yeah, it, I think it kind of helps the story become legend because now it's other people telling their angles, bouncing yeah. it around. And it just, it's amazing. We actually, the board, we did the the coast, I think, yeah, the coast film festival in Laguna Beach. And uh, the <laughs> the guy that's related to the guys in the This Is Your Life section has the board Duke used. Oh, really? And he brought it out. And it was wow. just fun because Dwayne was there. And I'm like, Dwayne, because Dwayne's held the board in Australia. I was like, Dwayne, you got to hold this board. He's like, why? I'm like, cause you're going to be the only guy I know of that's held two boards that were carved by Duke. And so, yeah. So we got these pictures of Dwayne holding the board up and Amazing. Dwayne's like, I can't do it. We're all like crying, of course. You know, but it's like, you know, it's one of those things. It's just, it's just cool. The, the idea of kind of centering the film around the, this is your life uh, yeah. segment is really, really smart as well. And kind of using that to keep coming back and because they're ultimately telling the story that you're telling. Oh, yeah. And so to be able to have that footage and tell it that way was really smart. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of nonlinear storytelling. And it's a, a well, I'm a big Danny Boyle fan. And that's what he okay. loves. That's, that's what he yeah. does with all of this stuff, you know, and my original movie was written that way out of this. And it was just, I don't know, there's something about being able to go back and see the person remember the moment that makes it so much cooler for me totally. than if we're just trying to go from beginning to end. You know, yeah. if you get, cause then you get to go, oh my gosh, look at it, it's still getting them. Like, yeah. like the rescue scene, you know, yeah. we go through everyone cheering for him and then you look at his face yeah. when, when he's like, like it hits him just as fast as he's happy that how sad he is too, mm -hmm. which also makes the ending even more touching, but. 
Yeah. Um, can you, ex considering Duke's uh, worldwide fame, considering his immense skill sets, yeah. can you explain why his financial success was limited? Yeah. Well, I mean, his, his fame was based on him being an amateur athlete. And at the time, with things like the Olympics and those, they usually came from wealthy clubs and wealthy areas. I mean, it was really America and Europe is what the Olympics were at the time. And, and so being amateur was easy because you usually came from wealth and you usually came from people that would take care of you as you did all these cool things to represent a club. Duke did not come from that. He was just an incredible athlete and an Irishman in charge of the U S just wanted to beat England. And that's why he's like, I don't care what color you are. We're beating England. You know? And so he's just, you know, the Irish, they love that. Yeah. And so he, uh, he adds Jim Thorpe and, and Duke, Jim Thorpe's gone instantly when they find out he's paid what, like a couple bucks to play a baseball game. You know, he's no longer an amateur athlete and Hawaii knows that their fame is built off of Duke. You know, it's, it's based on him right now and he's the face everyone wants. So he needs to keep winning Olympics. And, and the downfall, or I don't know what the word is for that. It's just the sad part about it is that that means he has to remain amateur and rely on the people around him to take care of him. And by the time he retires, because he's, he's, his last Olympics were when he was 42, which is crazy. Wow. you know. And so when he's in his 40s and finally retired from swimming, there he is, there he is jobless, a high school dropout with, with no real skill set that would work in a normal job situation you know he comes back to hawaii and the first job the government helps him out with is he's a janitor out there and it's like he goes from the guy you know to a janitor in their buildings and then pumping gas at a gas station and yeah it it's the problem i think is that and we do it all the time still today it's it's fame people sometimes think fame means wealth and that's not the case. That's not the case at all. Yeah. Olympians especially would be able to say that, you know, it's, totally. it's just, it's not how it works. And with Duke, it was just, it was even bigger because, you know, he was just such a huge face for a culture and for all these things, people just assumed he was well taken care of. And then Duke, he always gave away everything he had anyway. So he was mm -hmm. always sharing, you know, he, before he was officially the ambassador of Aloha, he was spending every penny he had on on stuff to give people when they visited Hawaii. You know, he'd make money and then go get lays and things and gifts because a celebrity that was coming to see him. Right. You know, and so even when he did have a little money, he was sharing it with others because he wanted people to, he wanted to be a good experience for everybody and he wanted to represent the best of Hawaii at all times. Right. And so he was, he was that, but yeah, he was, he was so focused on others. He never really took care of himself. And that's rough. There's there's an opportunity obviously with that much fame that you can go to Hollywood and make it big. And so, yeah. and try to make a living there. And so he does that as well. But obviously the movie tells the story of Hollywood was still racist or, yeah. you know, and my, maybe still is, but like, Oh yeah. It just, well, the there guy, were the no... guy smoking the cigarette. Like there's that little scene I show. Cause it's, it's very, it was a big one for me. That's the guy that did birth of a nation. That's like putting the cigarette in the air right there, which is like the pinnacle of, incredible filmmaking and psychotic racist racist stuff right. like it's like unreal how racist it is even though it's so brilliant from an artistic perspective and and like that's that's kind of yeah that's what duke was running into in the end that was the one thing he couldn't break is is he they couldn't make him a, they couldn't give him a leading lady and he couldn't when he was you know when he was still an amateur athlete he could never swim in a movie because then he's paying to get to swim in a movie so yeah. he has to it's a real paradox and yeah. the the other thing that's crazy about it is there's a co contemporary of his johnny weissmuller yeah who comes in at the same moment so you can compare here's a white guy here's a non-white guy they have the exact same credentials yeah you could argue duke was more famous and johnny's hollywood career completely takes off he becomes yeah. tarzan he gets all these leading roles and well and, and he invented that yodel just so everyone knows like johnny oh, Weissmuller, really? he was a real yodeler he was german you know oh, so he okay. had this yodel well german american he was totally american but he had that german heritage to him and yeah that he was a yodeler that just did that oh they're like yes yeah. and now it's tarzan you know but yeah it's it's that is one of the the best best ways to show how how it was back then, you know, yeah. that Duke had to battle just to get into what he was in, 
Johnny steps in and superstar, just like exactly. that. And it wasn't yeah. just Johnny, it was it was Crab right after that, the guy that became the first Flash Gordon. Like it was like the next three superstar swimmers were all superstars on the movie yeah. screens. You yeah. know, it's it's that's one of the hard ones to swallow. And it's it's it actually is. one of the reasons I took a lot of the things I did. I wanted to give Duke Hollywood on this. I really did. I wanted to show Duke he's a star. And so that's why like I have a it, I, I was insistent on an orchestra scoring this from beginning to end and and then making sure the recreations i didn't care how much money i had i wanted it to look like a million dollar movie for duke you know and so it was like because it's it is the one hurdle he couldn't get over you know and it's 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 really sad too when you watch it because the johnny weissmiller thing it's like oh no like you can hear no. the audience when they're watching it like oh because the thing is they're best friends they yeah. loved each other yeah. You know, Duke trained Johnny to beat him. You know, it's like, yeah. it's, it's like just a, just a sad moment. And Johnny yeah, relied on Duke too, because Johnny was a party animal. The only ways he, he, he was just very honest about when I'm with Duke, I don't do things. I can actually focus. And it's like Duke, that's why Duke's like, oh, cover it up when, when he comes out there, because it's like, oh, here's the party animal. We got to make sure right. <laughs> everything's good. You know, because yeah. he loved Johnny and he loved seeing Johnny at his best even when Johnny yeah. was beating him. Right. Yeah. That's the other thing is he was always supportive despite all of that. You yeah. Know. Um, oh, why did you, what's that? <laughs> oh, it was just the sun went away from my window. Oh, anyway. <laughs> um, why did you opt not to tell uh, any of the personal details of Duke's life that the book goes into like the Doris Duke stuff and all that? Uh, it was, it just, it created too many side roads. It was the biggest problem for me. You know, I, I, I did have sections on there because Doris Duke really her story gets it's more into the Kahanamoku families with Sam specifically, you know, so it's like one of those things where it was like, you know, how far do I push this one and and yeah just it. It ended up being a side road that just took too much time away from other things that we could talk about with Duke, you yeah. know it's and especially since it didn't have as much to do with him as it did Sam and so it's it's and that's really that's Sam's story in the end. You know, I mean, yeah. she loved, obviously she loved Duke, but she was all about all of them. Yeah. So uh, let me try and fix one. Can I fix something real quick? Yeah, here? absolutely. Sorry. I just noticed no. a weird light went out on me over there. That's anyway. all good. I'm mainly using the audio, so. It's okay. Um, um, how did you get Jason Momoa involved for the, the narration? That, hey, like I said, you know, if you want to, if you want to want to get something from a poly boy, go to their uncles, you know, so <laughs> it's kind of how it worked out with him. It was, uh, oh God, we, we got going on this and the Kealanas are all family for, for, for Jason. He's a Makaha boy. He's, he's a West side boy. I mean, you look at that scar on his forehead, that on his eyebrow that's that's from a kaha so he's a uh, he, he's he knows that area well and as we got working on this stuff you know word got out that we weren't making something just to you know let's tell the story of duke it wasn't gonna be cheap it wasn't gonna look bad it was like uh, we were dead set on making duke showing off duke to the world the way we see him and so uh billy pratt one of our guys that i'd, I'd mentioned earlier he he knew some people that could connect us brian kailana spends a lot of time with Jason, a lot of guys, we just started hitting them from different angles. So, cause it's getting through all the people in front of him is a hard thing to do, but it was just, just so he knew, I, you know, there was no way we knew if he'd actually want to do it, but as soon as it got to him, his uncles told him, they're like, Hey, this would be, this would be a really good thing for Hawaii. And with Jason, I mean, his love for that culture, for his culture, you know, for his people, for all that is just so thick that, you could tell that it hit the right tone for him and he offered to do it. He, he wanted to Amazing. do it and he came on board and man, he kills it. He it's kills like, it. It's, it's one of my favorite things that like, like when you work with singers, you know, in the recording, you tell them to smile while they sing because you can hear the smile. And, and with Jason, it's, you know, with, you can hear the love he has for this story, for Duke, for Hawaii, for all these things. And just in the way he does it. And it's, it's, it's beautiful. I love it. I yeah, love it. I love he, the way he, he absolutely kills it. Um, who wrote his narration? Well, I did the first round of it, and then we brought in some guys. 
that had done some Disney stuff actually to help clean it up, make it a little more poetic than I do, you know, and it's because, you know, I'm not, I'm not the best writer in the world, but, but also the way I, I like to direct, honestly, is I let them do it the way they want, you know, and that's, so it was, I wrote out the, the initial ideas of, of lines. These guys helped me turn them into like very good narration. And then, yeah. and then from there, we give it to Jason. And I'm like, Kate, I'll just say it how you would say it. Got it. And then, and then he does it, you know, his way, the way he loves Hawaii. And so it just hits nice and hard. It's really, really well written. It oh, like stood geez. out at how well written it was because the essence of, um, you know, the ocean being a barrier and an obstacle for a lot of people, for other nations, but the ocean being the pathway for the Hawaiians and kind of those kind of important essence things yeah. were like profound and spot on. And then the poetry as well. And they were, the sentences were structured beautifully, oh, you know? Thanks, so man. I was like, and he nails it. And I was just like, gosh, this is a slam dunk. <laughs> well, it's a, it's funny. Cause like my producer is like, they're like, are you sure? Cause I mean, it's, you know, Jason's voice, he's not your typical, let's go to that guy for a documentary voice. And it's just like, I was like, no, I think it'll work and in my it head. Totally I'm like, man, man, I hope it works, you know, but it was like, <laughs> but then, yeah, I remember I laid down that first line, that water line, and then put it played it for the guys and it just comes in it's like water and it was like yeah. everyone's like oh like we got yeah. something it's like we got a movie because it, it totally. was just the that's way the thing it, it it's funny that you talked about this wanting you wanted this to be like a feature uh film yeah and yeah. it is it's still cinematic i mean you still wedged all that stuff in perfectly it fits perfectly oh, but man. i'm also thinking that this will open the doors to that as well i got to imagine there's conversations now about turning this into a film a oh, feature yeah. narrative film yeah no I've, I've actually been talking to some other people that they knew my original intention and it's kind of been fun to talk to them about it it's i mean there's so many things behind the scenes you know like like how do you figure out the rights with duke's name going beyond here you know because now you get it because movies you know docs they, they're docs are fun they're informational and they do a lot of things obviously i Whenever, whenever I told people I was doing this doc, I'm like, I want it to feel like a movie that happens to be a doc. That's the way I always told people the way I was going to do it. But, but movies, like that's where big money, big things happen. So you also want to make sure you do it right so that Hawaiians and the people that love Duke don't feel like he's being exploited again. So it becomes a very, it's, it's a tricky road. But yeah, yeah, there's, I, there's a lot of people that have come. And it's like, I, of course, I'll talk to all of them. I'm like, yeah, how do we do, how do, we do this into a movie? How do we completely immortalize Duke? You know, you know, it's like, how do I get him a star in Hollywood? How do I do these things? You know, it's yeah. like, you know, there's a lot of things I'd love to do for this guy, but yeah. it's, uh, yeah, that's, man, it's still a dream. And I'm curious to see where it goes. Yeah, me too. I, if, if you get some that's slumdog millionaire ish, the way I'd originally written it, I'll be in heaven. You yeah. Know? Cause that, that's I a great comparison or analogy. Yeah. I just, yeah. Well, I just, I love the idea of trying to make it artsy and impactful. Yeah. So that, cause I feel like, like, well, Slumdog did a great job with it being playing with like your emotions, the way art can, and yeah. especially film in a ways that you'll never forget the story. You yeah. know, I, I feel like, I think the, the thing with Duke, which makes it fun with this doc is that when you put, not everyone knew all the parts of his story. And so when you just pack in as much as you can into one little session, you start to realize that we never should have forgotten this guy, right. that he should be in the, all the history books, you know, talked about quite a bit. But I just think his biggest problem was is is that people didn't ever put all the stories in one place, you know, until really yeah, exactly. until David Davis, you know, right. he's one of them that did it, and then and he he let me crush it down into this. So yeah, so yeah. Um, I was glad to see the theatrical release. Obviously, it deserves it. Uh, but the the yeah. world, yeah, the world is such a weird place right now, especially with COVID. Um, so what is the release strategy? And it seems to be in a lot of theaters. I looked locally and it's in like five within driving distance for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, I know it's in all those theaters in Cal it's in every theater in Utah and Hawaii. I know okay. that, you know, and people go, why Utah? It's like, well, the largest population of Polynesians outside of Hawaii is in Utah. So it made sense. Like you should have seen one screening we had here was over 700 people. It was just, it was nuts to see wow. how many, Paul, and they were all, it was, it was a bunch of my peeps, a bunch of brownies in there, you know, just with our, 
you know, drinking kava outside and just doing everything we do. <laughs> you know, it's like it's kind of our thing. But it's a, uh, it's you know, it's I think the rollout goes from California now is kind of a well, let's see who wants it now out of there. Luckily, it's it's done way better than a lot of us thought it would do. Yeah, I've I've always had a hard time. But I was like I was like, man, I don't know. Dukes in theater, I mean, docs in theaters are pretty. They're a hard sell. People, you know, theaters are escapism. They're not necessarily lessons. And so it's it's uh even though I wanted it, I was just like I was kind of prepared for the worst on this. Yeah. And so that it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun just to and I've been sneaking in theaters all over the place. When the credits hit, they shut off Good. the audio and let me go in there and just like thank the crowd. It's and it's fun to see the reaction on people's faces on what Duke means to them now. People yeah. that never knew who he was or people that only knew part of a story. It's just really fun. Oh man, in Hawaii the seeing some of the the old, old, old Beach Boys come out and just like just the appreciation and love that they have. It's just like, oh, it's it's been worth every penny, every every moment. Well, what's incredible is that a number of his Duke's contemporaries are still alive. You yeah. Know? yeah. Maybe they were a little bit younger, but people who certainly knew him. I mean, Paul Strau, Fred Hemmings, you get interviews with all these guys who actually knew him well. Now, now Paul Strau, everyone, especially the Californians, everyone needs to go down to that surf museum and, and just shake that man's hand. He he is, yeah. if you want to feel that spirit of Duke, that spirit of Aloha, that's one of them. That guy just it just oozes out of him. And, and he, and he was insistent too. He's such a kind man, but he's like, it needs to be about Aloha. It needs to, like over and over again. He's like, it has to be Aloha. And I was like, I got you, man. I got you. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. Like you can't talk about Duke without Aloha. Yeah. Um, back to the distribution for listeners who are somewhere that the film is not theatrically playing when and where can they see it? Do you think? Um, oh, I don't know exactly what's going on next. I know PBS is going to run it you know they picked it up to run it in may sometime in may okay I, I can't remember the exact date on it so everyone look at that american masters has put it on their slate to run it amazing so, yeah that's which huge. is i mean that's is it as, as someone that does make documentaries you know i mean i want to, i'm more music videos movies but i made a lot of docs that's kind of a fun badge to wear it's like whoa crap okay that's that's that little PBS logo sure feels pretty good on you, you know? So, and it fits, it fits perfectly with the American master series. It does. It does. And it's, it's a real honor for them to come in. I'm not used to working with stuff quite like that. So it's like weird to take film and switch it back into network TV style, yeah, but it's just totally. fun that that audience gets to see this guy the way that I know him, you know, it's, it's really special, but yeah, so they, they've added it to their slate. It'll be in May, which is also, but Asian and Pacific Islander month. So it's a good timing for them on that okay. one. And then, and then after that is when we start talking to the streaming services, but we're going to okay. wait for PBS to get their time with it. Do you have a preference for where you would like to see it live on? Uh, wherever people can just see it. You know, my, yeah. my main goal was always that for the, for America, especially because the world actually has done a pretty good job of remembering Duke, but for America, especially to know that when we talk about Jesse Owens and Jim Thorpe and Muhammad Ali and Jackie Robinson, that that we talk about Duke, that he is that important to American history and to sports history in the world. And and so it's it's the more people that see it, I think the more people would agree with him belonging in that conversation. So for me, it's 100%. where does it go? You know, I love Netflix. The only problem I've ever had with Netflix is they have too many good things they don't promote. You know, that's, uh, that's the only thing they have. Like, I don't know how many docs I've watched on there where I'm like, this is amazing. You know, like, why didn't, why didn't I ever know about this? But it's, you know, whatever, whatever gets at eyeballs, you know, I, well, I'm, that's what the, I'm um, I agree with you. They don't promote hardly anything, but other media companies do. Like yeah. I notice more and more, like, the New York Times will be like the top 10 things on Netflix yeah. now that you should be watching. Or whatever, <laughs> that, uh, you, know? you know, that's it. I'm glad you brought that. That's a good point. I, I forgot about that. Those are always in the newspaper now. Or yeah. like top and it used that Sweet used to just dish. they used to just be for like a clickbaity websites that would do the top 10 list of yeah. random stuff. But now legitimate right. news outlets with their film critics yeah. are saying these are the best 10 documentaries I've seen on this streaming platform recently. You know, that's a so. really, really good point. You're right. That's in, and then when that's the case, you start going, okay, you know, maybe a Netflix, cause Netflix is everywhere, you know? I, but yeah, I don't know. Cause I, I, 
like HBO does a really good job of promoting their docs. So it's they like, do. it's like you, but they're also harder to reach for a lot of people, you know? So it's they're They're also, it seems to be investing in sports documentaries mm-hmm. too. Like there's been a number, um, the Jake Burton one recently was really good. They just did a Tony Hawk one. That's really good. Yeah. And so, yeah, there, this would fit right in line with those, yeah. but I agree with what you're saying is, wherever people can see it and Netflix has the biggest subscriber base. Yeah. So it, that would make it perfect does, sense. You know, cause yeah, I mean, there's also Apple, they just started their whole thing with the WSL that they're going to be doing. So it's like, a, you know, where you, where you try to figure out things can land with Apple. I mean, I, I love Apple's programming, but there's, they play the Amazon game where they go for quality over quantity. So yeah. they, it's like not a lot. So yeah, maybe, yeah, I don't know. Exactly. Whoever, wherever the most eyeballs are. Good. Um, the final question I have for you is just personal. Like, I was curious if you know anything more about that Jan Fisher story about him uh, getting commissioned to make that yeah. statue. That's do you know? Do you, yeah. Do you know how that even happened or was, how he got that opportunity? Yeah. They, well, it was the Outrigger Club that wanted to make it, which is one of the fun ironies again when you know how the, how it all began. Yeah. You know, but they're the ones that wanted to make the statue, and so and Fred Hemmings was the one like supercharged. This is gonna happen. Pushing it, fighting okay. for it. And so, yeah, they had artists submit, you know, all different versions of things they'd want to do. And my uncle, Jan, he should have been a documentarian too. He should have been making documentaries, but he decided to first do tons and tons of research on Duke and create an entire binder of Duke. Cause again, it's obvious he comes from my mom's family because he felt the intention behind his fingers should be guided by knowledge. And so that's, that's what he did. And then he created his small version of Duke that he would do. And that's what won them over on it. They're like, whoa, there's something different with this one. And then they commissioned him to do the bigger one. And and he, I mean, he'd also done, if you go to Maui, he's he's done over a hundred statues of Maui. So he was oh, really he was doing statues all over the place. He was well known, but you know, Duke's a big one. And and he uh yeah, that's they won him over. And and it hit to him, it was like, oh, the intention was what got him there. Cause he you know, when you feel like you're going to cry because this person means so much to you, it'll change the way you do things. And, and that's that's what he was that's what he was built on. You know, there's even a secret in that statue. There's a, a Nadine Duke's wife came in for the last like when he finished the the huge clay version of it. You know, she came in and she decided to mark. She she was like, well, I want the shorts here, and she took her keys and just went cheek where she wanted the shorts to go. And my uncle was like, eh, I kind of like where they're at. He's like, but I'm going to leave that. <laughs> so he left he left her key marks from where her shorts are supposed to go on the statue. Wow. So when, so when people go check out the statue, you, of course, you got to do what I do. I always tap my uncle's name to say hi to Hawaii, you know, when I go there because it's on the right foot of Duke. And then I then you look up just next to the shorts and there's the key marks where she thought the shorts should go. And it's wow. kind of fun. That's Nadine's little mark on the statue. Yeah. So the Outrigger Club paid for that? Yeah, they, well, they they paid, but they also gathered the funding from the hotels gotcha. and the people to make it. So they're, but they were, the the driving force and really, Fred Hemmings of the Outrigger Club. You know, he's the one that pulled them into it to get it to happen. Amazing. Yeah. What a good boys. So, do you have any idea where the miniature statue is that he used as the model? Uh, you know, my uncle was kind of adamant on destroying those things because he wanted wow. the. He wanted, he didn't like the original to be something else. He wanted the original to be big. Like my aunts have done a lot. Like there's a couple of statues. He was mid destruct destroying like the clay versions and they, they go steal them. They're like, no, <laughs> don't yeah. do that. But I, I, I'd imagine to be honest, that one exists somewhere, somewhere hidden, you know, like that binder he made is still at one of my cousin's houses out on the big Island. And so it's, okay. uh, you know, there's things that our family wouldn't let him break, <laughs> you know, Good. Cause he's such a purist, you know, he's like, no, this is now the original, get rid of that. You know, it's like, he's one of those. So I fully agree with him that he should be a purist and he should demolish everything. Yeah. But I also fully agree with the people around him that they should be saving all that oh, stuff. I know. It's like, well, what got you the job? I want to see that one, you know? It's exactly. Like, well, yeah. it's, re- it's a relic now. You know what I mean? It's an important yeah. part of history now. Well, and he probably didn't, he probably, I mean, maybe he did. I can't speak for him, but you know, he probably had no idea how big, like this statue is iconic in Hawaii now. It's, it's one of those things. It's that iconic knows. around the world. It's like when you see yeah. an image of Waikiki, it's diamond head or that. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, you always see the statue tourists in front of the statue. You know, that's one of my, 
one of my hopes and dreams with this is every time we go to Hawaii, I usually take about an hour, 20 minutes, somewhere in there just to sit in front of the statue because just hoping someday I would see a tourist that would walk up to it and know exactly who Duke was without having to read it. Just go, oh my gosh, it's Duke. And then talk about Duke. You know, I, someday I, I just hope to see it, you know, and it's, yeah. this is like, this doc is kind of my way of throwing that out there. Like, Hey, well, I'm helping. Hopefully it happens, you know, cause yeah. it, it just, it would make me giddy, you know, it's, totally. it's, and I would never tell them, Hey, I made the doc or anything like that. I just would want to see it. You know, as when this was going out in Hawaii, they were playing the commercials for this on the elevators. And it was oh, just wow. kind of fun to ride the elevators in the hotel I was in and hear people talk about the doc and never say, Oh yeah, I made that. I just wanted to hear people talk about Duke. And it was like making yeah. me happy. So I love all your little stories of experiencing the documentary in the real world. It's a <laughs> wild ride for you. Oh, it's fun. I mean, I grew up it's on the so stage. Cool. I, I was a dancer. I grew up performing my whole childhood up until I was 25 on stages. And so audience, was always my thing and, and so it's fun now to kind of get the audience everywhere i go like just to kind of get a little chance to to, to just see it do something you yeah. know because it's like this is for duke i want to see if it's doing something congrats man really soak it up and enjoy every minute of it from oh, dealing with those networks for distribution <laughs> yeah. the meetings the tedium all of oh, it yeah. just enjoy it all the things you don't want to do like like enjoy reconforming a, a shot to something that fits their framing or something, you know, it's like, it's like, okay, it's for Duke. Okay. I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, this is a great work and yeah, you should be proud. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it was, it's a dream come true in a heavy way. So it's, uh, it's just fun to see it out there and just to hope it does something for Duke. I'm, I'm really glad to see it. I thought it was really well done. So bravo. Thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you for taking the time to, to do this. And can I get you to say your last name so I yeah. make sure that I say it correctly in post? No, you're right. Well, if you want to know the secret to Polynesian anything, just so you know, is we didn't have a re we didn't have a written language until the 1800s with missionaries. And so, because they wanted to teach you the Bible, but they needed you to be able to read the Bible. So what they would do is they would sound out Polynesian words and write them out with Latin rules. So the idea is if you know Spanish, follow the same rules of Spanish when you speak something in, from any of the islands and, and you'll get it right. Okay. The -E -O -U. So it's like me, mine is, it's Isaac Halasima. Halasima. Yeah, it's just a Halasima. So it's like, a, Halasima. yeah, it's, if you say it like you're speaking Spanish, you'll nine, 99 times out of 100, you're saying it right. Okay. That's really helpful. Yeah, it, it helps in Hawaii a lot. So what does the T stand for? uh oh timothy yeah oh okay it's kind of funny actually my <laughs> my dad's name is timote which in tonga is timothy and tongan and yeah, yeah. my mom was like no i want him to have you know just a different no not one of those he's like oh okay oh timothy <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> the irony is that my next brother was born and that he's named timote so my dad's oh, like really? dad you named all of us you They're like what the heck <laughs> amazing that's like george foreman yeah he's exactly. got eight kids georgina georgette george georgie <laughs> exactly. dude my dad was at that my dad was beating him on that game so <laughs> amazing all right well hey thank you so much for doing this i will obviously direct people to all of your um everywhere to find the film and all that sort of stuff oh yeah thanks man that'd be awesome thank you cool yeah cool. all right man have a good one hey you too dude okay take it easy Bye.